the meeting in terms of muting and unmuting. I would appreciate it. Will do. Thank you so much. Uh, and I think I guess I get the feedback when they're unmuted because of using my cell phone instead of my speaker. So we're going to go ahead and get started. And I uh, want to welcome everybody to the uh, International Cardio-Oncology uh, Society monthly webinar. Um, Dr. Lenahan is going to be joining us shortly. He's on rounds this morning. He's the attending uh, every two weeks, once a month. So he will come in a little later, and so will his fellow. Uh, I'm going to tell you about uh, an interesting case that we had, just to, to open some questions about how to evaluate people who received radiation therapy who may have injury to the main left and LED, which is our biggest concern. And so we have this gentleman who's a 67-year-old Caucasian married male, has a history of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. This was 20 years ago when he received uh, chemotherapy involving adriamycin. He also had chest radiation treatments. The lymphoma was uh, posterior near the spine. And so I don't know how they approached uh, this. The radiation was probably anterior so as not to involve the spine as much as possible. And so um, that involves then uh, the anterior circulation. And so usually when we see patients with Hodgkin's disease who had prior radiation, the first thing you go to is LAD and main left. That's the biggest concern. And it seems to be uh, pretty common, too, as being what we find. So let's talk about this patient and how we proceeded to evaluate him. He has maintained uh, and then been in touch with NIH for the whole 20 years where he's been followed. And so this gentleman, uh, when I first came to know him, had had on August 15th left arm pain radiating to the left chest. It was very sharp. It was very uh, severe. And it woke him up from sleep at 3 a.m. The day before, he had a five-mile walk. He didn't have any breakfast. He worked all day as a real estate developer. At 2.30, uh, he had a mega meal where he had uh, fried fish, pork, hush puppies, fried chicken, greens, pecan pie, ice cream. They thought this was a real gallbladder challenge, and so we were interested in it being any gallstones. He went shopping, had no problems, walked the mall, had two glasses of wine at 5 p.m., skipped dinner. This is very unusual uh, dietary habits the schedule, and then uh, slept at 9.30 p.m., went to bed, and then woke up at 3 a.m. and had the chest pain. He continued to 9 a.m. He took some uh, nitroglycerin that he got in the ER, and the pain continued there in the ER. He went to Tampa General. His EKG showed left anterior, left axis deviation, and he had uh, normal sinus rhythm. Chest X-ray showed some linear scar, atelectasis at the right lung base, and elevation of the right hemidiaphragm. His echocardiogram uh, that was done at Tampa General Hospital showed an ejection fraction in the 50 to 55 percent range. He had some leakiness of the aortic valve, but it was not bicuspid. And uh, they said he had left ventricular hypertrophy in the text. However, when he went back and looked at the numbers, they it was uh, interventricular septum was 0.9. The posterior wall was 0.9. So that didn't make any sense. Maybe they hit the wrong computer key when they were typing it up. He also had uh, an exercise spec scan that was entirely normal, injection fraction of 70%. We'll get back to that in a minute. His troponin uh, was 0 0.03 and 0 0.031. CPK was normal. Creatinine was normal. His white count was 26,000, and we'll tell you more about that, too. Gentleman had uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma on the spine, L10 to 11, treated the radiation to the chest. He had a uh, chemotherapy that was called promise mop and this was diagnosed in 1989. He's been followed by the NIH yearly since that time. Five years ago, he developed CLL. He's been followed by his local hematologist yearly, as well as followed by the NIH. Has a history of GERD, reticulosis, 
tonsillectomy, hernia repairs times two, his family history of heart disease, his father had a fatal heart attack at age 63, mother also had coronary heart disease, died at 86, he's a non-smoker, drinks a glass of wine uh, just about daily. His medications have been Libax, Librax, 600 milligrams PRN, help him sleep or if he had anxiety, taking aspirin, 81 milligrams twice a day, multivitamins, probiotics, CoQ10, fish oil, olive leaf, red marine algae, and so interesting herbals that he's taking that I don't know a lot about. His blood pressure is 120 over 70, heart rate 91. He did have a diastolic decrescendo murmur that was very light. It was like 1 to 2 over 6. And so this raises the question then of how do we evaluate a patient 20 years after radiation to the anterior coronary circulation, unknown anthracycline dose uh, exposure? And so I thought we'd talk a little bit about that. And uh, I think first we have a, a reasonable start would be to look at LV function because of the anthracycline exposure. And so we did also repeat his echocardiogram that he had because of the question about the LVH, the severity of his aortic regurgitation, whether he had a bicuspid aortic valve. And so we can shoot with his echo. So let me go to the echo. Hang on here. And here we go. You can see from his EKG that he has a normal sinus rhythm. You see I have to sort of scroll through this to be able to uh, get any action going here. Because there's a delay. This is his bicuspid aortic valve. And I'll try to scroll through this some. And the echocardiogram uh, is very hard to display, and there's a lag in what I'm showing. And this is a bicuspid aortic valve. I don't think we're going to be able to uh, get this to show up very well for you. But nevertheless, he has three plus a regurgitation. And I think we'll be able to show his other studies better than this one. And I'm sorry about it not projecting well here. And there's his aortic regurgitation that we saw for a minute there. Go back to uh, the text. And so we did check the gallbladder uh, at the same time. We had him come in without having had anything to eat. And so his gallbladder, we also looked at his carotid and found non calcified and calcified carotid plaque, which is pretty usual for this age group. We did not find left ventricular hypertrophy in this patient, which was consistent with the measurements at Tampa General, but uh, was not consistent with the text at Tampa General. The question comes up, how do we evaluate the potential 
of accelerated coronary artery disease and cardiac structural change from radiation therapy and possible functional changes? And so this is a good question. Do we do stress tests to find out about functional uh, capacity and abilities? Uh, uh, does coronary CTA trump exercise testing and imaging? And uh, certainly it's been shown in low and intermediate risk groups that coronary CTA does trump. And uh, there's a nice review that Anatomy Trumps All by Leslie Shaw in uh, the Jack Cardiovascular Imaging June 2013 issue. And there was a very nice study comparing exercise testing uh, with several modalities, uh, including coronary CT. And certainly coronary CT was superior in this particular research study with uh, 681 patients in the groups that were low to intermediate pretest likelihood of coronary artery disease. And so unless we, for Leslie Shaw to agree with that is uh, very critical thinking. So uh, basically, I chose to evaluate as accurately as possible the coronary anatomy, the coronary CTA, since I had a strong interest in ruling out mean left coronary disease and proximal LAD disease in this patient over other possible but less dangerous lesions. As, as you know, the main issue with radiation exposure is main left disease. And as you know, we're, we have a lot of difficulty detecting main left disease uh, in patients with imaging exercise studies. So I'll pause for a minute. And Janelle, if we can give uh, the audience some opportunity to, uh, to, give, to ask questions at this time. All right, we're going to unmute everybody. Again, if you don't want us to hear the background noise in your room, you do have the option to mute yourself. And I've got the attendees listed. I've got the attendees listed. Greg, uh, would you like to say Greg? something about, uh, about the patient's uh, the radiation exposure? and uh, whether you would do some form of exercise testing and imaging, or whether you would cut to the chase in coronary CTA. Um, well, I think that for uh, evaluating his chest pain specifically, that the exercise test can be useful, just, you know, maybe even more so the um, how many METs he does, if he has chest pain on the treadmill, that kind of thing. Um, so I'd be, I would have been interested to know how he looked on the treadmill for his spec. Um, and I think especially since we get such a high uh, rate of equivocal uh, stress tests uh, just in terms of ETTs, that um, there is literature out there that uh, suggests the CTA can be a nice complementary test when these uh, other tests are equivocal even if not the test you go straight to. Um, certainly in, in this guy with uh, concern for left main, um, where the spec can have a higher false negative rate, I do think that going straight to CTA, given the character of his chest pain and his pretest probability being on the low to probably intermediate side, that um, you know he would, um, you could make a case for going straight to that as well. Joe, do you have any comments, uh, Dr. Carver? Uh, Greg, uh, I was interested in uh, you found out that he's walking about five miles a day getting chest pain. Does that do anything in uh, persuading you for a different choice? Um, I mean, I, I, I think that's encouraging. Um, I, I would like to see him, or I wouldn't mind seeing him 
you know, in the setting of some higher level exercise. Um, I think it's more of a, it, it may be more of a complementary test um, in terms of a, a functional test that I would, in, in this case, maybe even put more stock in um, than the spec just in terms of contextualizing his, his right, chest pain. Okay. Any other comments? A D I M U. Amy, can you hear me? A D U A I M A S. Hello. Go ahead, Judy. Okay. Um, so I guess one of the things that I would be curious about is um, whether you think that he's likely to have calcified plaque. Um, both. I, I don't know how old he was, I think you said he was in his 60s, both maybe because of age and radiation, and whether that would limit you from being able to say much about the degree of stenosis you might find if there was heavy plaque burden that was calcified plaque with CTA. Hey, that's a good point. Calcified plaque with calcium getting in the way. When you can't imagine uh, a blooming artifact that makes the calcium sort of outshine everything. Any other comments? Unmuted. Dr. Shawi? Karma? Well, as. Well, let's go on then. to do PTA was well, I'm also interested in the myocardium, the valves, and obviously it does have some valve disease, aortic valve, but it looks like that's congenital because I read it as valcuspid. How about the pericardium? We certainly can see the coronaries very well. That was my main focus, but I'm also looking at ancillary findings. And, uh, and then the question is if we do find plaque, what does that mean, and how do we, how do we treat him, in terms of medical or surgical? So let's move on. Let's let's engage this conversation a little bit more. And so I'd like to talk to you about what uh, what might be called the old atherosclerosis theory, which is the theory about the clogged pipe. And so it seems to me that we have come a long way in understanding a new paradigm of coronary artery disease. There's been progressive stenosis over a long incubation period, and that results in high-grade occlusion. Certainly radiation might accelerate that. And then it's been theorized in the past that with the high-grade occlusion that a platelet thrombus would be the coup de grace to occlude an artery, stop flow, and cause a STEMI. Unfortunately, uh, historically, our stress tests have not been very successful at, uh, in the real world at sleuthing this out. And it turns out that Blue Cross Blue Shield in Michigan did a study of spec scanning and found 40% false positives, 65% false negatives, which means of 100 people who don't have heart disease, we tell 40 of them that they do. And of 100 people who do have heart disease, we tell 65 of them that they don't. And so that's in the real world, Blue Cross Blue Shield, a lot of patients in Michigan trying to deal with this. There's also at Vanderbilt, and Dr. Lanahan's not here yet, but at Vanderbilt there was the PREDICT study using Core CAD and using spectalium scanning. And the PREDICT study also showed false positives that were in the 40% uh, range and false negatives. With spec scanning in the literature, it's a lot happier a situation, and uh, the results seem to be a lot better. But when you go in the real world and talk to people, everyone's saying 50-50 chance of really getting to the heart of the matter. And that's what's driving cardiac catheterization uh, and giving us the 60% false positive rate excuse me, a 60% negative cardiac cath rate in, in, in the patients that are all having cardiac cath. And so uh, that's been 
the model and the utility of this model has been severely challenged by a new model and new tests. And so let's look at the new model. The new model is lesions that lead to an acute coronary syndrome are usually not sufficient to obstruct flow. They're usually less than 70%. This has been found by following lesions. Uh, this has been found by IVIS. It's been found in many circumstances. It seems to be that the pathophysiology is that there is a thin fibrous cap that ruptures, and that's the cause of most cardiac events. These plaques are characterized as being certain pathological findings, which are calcium and non-calcified plaques that have positive remodeling. The body's own reaction to the lipid deposits, both liquid and fibrous, is to sort of pave over these by calcifying them and then push them out. So you've got inside the vessel a lipid pimple, so to speak, uh, that has an inflammatory reaction surrounding it, mac macrocytes inside. There's a lot of activity going on in terms of cytokines, interleukins, and so what happens is the body reacts to that by putting, laying down calcium, um, and with the appetite that's laid down, basically then pushing it out in through the wall, as extending the wall, and remodeling. And so uh, thinning of the plaque uh, cap is related to the collagen equilibrium, where collagen is being laid down at the same time collagen is being absorbed. And as there's an imbalance in the equilibrium from which inflammatory responses, the cap can get microcalcification, which adds stress, and also to get thinning. Procoagulates -co are exuded from the plaque core by the fibrous cap black rupture, uh, and then the uh, uh, ensues, the thrombus ensues until of that uh, revascularization of severe stenosis has not consistently reduced the risk of acute coronary syndromes or death, except in the most severe cases. If you look at the Courage study, statin therapy lowers lipids, alters the plaque, and reduces inflammation, resulting in plaque stabilization. Other anti-inflammatory approaches may also be effective, such as intensification of the statin, statin therapy, aspirin, cochicine, uh, deriplobid, and methotrexate have been effective in reducing cardiac events by inhibiting inflammation. So that's the new model. Let's talk about the new model for a minute. I'm going to throw this open to the audience again uh, to see what kind of acceptance there is of the new model as opposed to severe stenosis, small platelet deposit, and then find it and fix it. Greg, would you like to comment on the new model? Greg, would you like to comment on the new model? Yeah, so I think this is where um, the coronary CTA can really fill in gaps that the traditional sort of risk models um, inherently miss, you know, the Framingham and all that kind of stuff. Um, so for our patient who's at high risk for events, um, whether or not this chest pain he's having now is truly an event or just an opportunity to diagnose him with high risk coronary disease that we could um, use preventative therapy more intensely with, um, you know, I think that this is where the coronary CTA really uh, will have a place in the future. Um, and probably will make a, its biggest difference is that we'll catch these people that don't have flow-limiting stenosis but have a, a moderate or high burden of coronary disease that medical therapy can really make a difference. That sounds like a good dialogue uh, that we started. Jenna, would you like? Uh, Jenna, would you like to comment or Jeannie? Uh, this is Dan. Sorry, this is Dan Lenahan at Vanderbilt. I was just, uh, you know, I think, I think that there are several studies ongoing, kind of looking at the utility of CT angio in, you know, sort of decision making. You guys kind of mentioned the uh, ischemia trial, and uh, 
you know, so where they're using CTA to help with that. But, uh, you know, I would also point out that in our annual cardiology oncology meeting that's going to happen in December, I got a submission for an abstract from uh, from the people at St. Jude's Children's looking at survivorship and the use of CT angio in that setting and uh, how how useful it was and what it what it uncovered so I think that the finding a diffuse burden of atherosclerosis is kind of a big picture here and you know certainly a CT angio is going to be probably the best test for doing that so that's a, that's a bold statement Dan I'm glad I like the way you're thinking. It certainly goes against uh, any current guidelines, but all current guidelines uh, are at least uh, several years old, if not five years old. And uh, and uh, the panels convened uh, are probably uh, traditional. Let's uh, let's move on now that we've engaged this and. Uh, talk about the focus on detecting coronary plaque and the amount of inflammatory reaction involved would be an important step in the recognition of those patients most vulnerable to cardiac events. And so we haven't even got to his anatomy yet, but I'd like to have some philosophy before we get there. And then, uh, and then we can see how we can apply what we understand to the patient's anatomy. So I'm still keeping uh, keeping that under wraps as uh, part of the mystery here and uh, to try to keep you engaged. And so let's, let's talk about this. So let's talk about detection of plaque and how that may actually exceed Framingham in some instances. So coronary calcification monitoring discovers old non-vulnerable remodeled plaque which is basically the burned out ruins of a prior inflammatory reaction. And it may or may not be associated with more dangerous forms of plaque that are liquid or fibrous with a thin cap. But just finding that someone had an old reaction or maybe has continuous old reactions to create coronary calcification is enough to predict uh, actually superior prediction to Framingham. So that certainly puts you in a new position if you're above Framingham in your predictive value. And then this has been applied to the MESA group where they have frozen serum of multi-ethnic population groups and basically the presence of coronary calcification also predict outcome in a diverse multi-ethnic population group. Again, superior to Framingham. So now we've already beat Framingham with coronary calcification. And I think that the superiority is that this implies that there may be non-calcified plaque. There may be an ongoing inflammatory reaction. And so it, although we find patients who have calcium scores of 4,000 who actually do not have inflammation going on, don't have thin fibers, caps, they don't have liquid plaque, and they don't have much fibrous disease. So whatever they had was was a reaction that occurred years ago, and what we're seeing is we're seeing the burned out hawk of what was uh, lipid deposits that have been walled off and protected the artery. And those people are really not at risk of, of anything. They just have stone pipes. So coronary CTA also reveals calcified and non-calcified plaque, but this is not added to predictive value of calcium score without further refinement. And so a lot of people say, well, we're going to do a calcium score, and then uh, let's go take a look at that. And then the student or the fellow will pipe up and say, well, if you're going to use that radiation for calcium score, why don't you just do a coronary CTA? which may nowadays involve the same radiation exposure, certainly less than freaking millisieverts, and maybe uh, even tenths of a millisievert. And so that argument is made. 
that that argument can be countered that it was not more predictive of without refinement. And so what is that refinement? And the refinement was non-calcified flock with vulnerable characteristics, which uh, basically is mixed flock with calcification as well as liquid, liquid lipid. And uh, flock has uh, 35 uh, Helmsfield units or less. Um, and there's an overlap between liquid and fibrous and plaque that has positive remodeling. Those were the characteristics of vulnerable plaque. And also, quantifying the amount of plaque, the burden of plaque and stenosis together, basically additive became incremental, especially in the proximal coronaries. And basically, this incremental prognostic value with a combined score, improved the risk prediction of calcium scoring, again, beyond framing hand. And so, yes, we are able, with more refined techniques, we are able to say that going beyond calcium score with non-calcified plaque can trump calcification. And so let's bring that up for discussion. Audience? Greg, would you like to comment on that? Sure. Um, so I think, uh, you know, and I've talked to Leslie Shaw about this, actually, and they are analyzing the um, confirm registry, which I think is up to around uh, 30,000 patients or more now um, where they've looked at coronary CTA in a variety of different settings of both screening and uh, symptomatic chest pain. Um, and they have Framingham um, sort of characteristics on a number of these people. And the issue with Framingham is that, you know, half the people you look at are intermediate uh, risk, uh, you know, so they'll benefit from further evaluation. And then um, of, of those people that you look at with, with um, just uh, calcium scoring, maybe you reclassify 25 to 30 percent. So still about a third of your people are intermediate um, risk based on their Framingham plus their calcium score of 110 or something like that. So I think this is a group where um, the coronary CTA could really help. I think if you have somebody that's low intermediate risk with zero coronary calcium, then um, you maybe you don't need to do any more. If you have somebody that's intermediate risk and has a calcium score of 500 or you know up into the quadruple digits, then maybe your coronary CTA isn't going to yield you a whole lot in the sort of screening um, type of population. But there is definitely a gap there that I think maybe a third of the people that you look at or a quarter, um, you know, even after calcium and Framingham, you're still left calling them intermediate risk. That's a good discussion. And certainly zero calcium score implies a very low likelihood of having non-calcified plaque. We count on our hands the patients we've seen like that. Not well, I, think, I think the other the other thing, and this certainly is a trigger for me, at least when, when I'm seeing patients that have, that we know to be at higher risk for uh, coronary disease or, or valvular disease in the case of if they've had mediastinal radiation or if they've had any type of uh, thoracic cancer treatment, then, you know, I think if you do a CT as part of the screening for, for their cancer and you see co uh, coronary calcification on that scan, then, you know, that is absolutely a indication to be more aggressive on aspirin and statin therapy in, the, in those patients. And so, for instance, you know, they may have a normal, normal cholesterol panel. But in, but in that context, I would, I would say, you know, there's a lot more compelling reason to put them on a statin if they have any minor abnormality and certainly an aspirin. So I think that, you know, the, the coronary CTA really can be a, an important preventive test. Can you hear me? Go ahead. Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, okay. Um, how do you get it paid for? Uh, here, our um, Anthem Blue Cross uh, absolutely would not pay for a coronary CT. Absolutely would not. 
That's a great way. question. Great question. And basically, uh, having an understanding of that was very important to our group in Tampa. And if we're going to have a cardiac imaging center with cardiac PET, CT, and MR, and it's an outpatient center related to a hospital, obviously we have to have the ability of payers recognizing that they need to help us. Yeah. And, so, and of course, I've been to the radi radi radiology benefits managers, of which there are five, which are Med Solutions, AIM, uh, Core Care, Health Health, and NIA, National Imaging Associates. And I've established my bona fides with them so that they understand what we're doing here in Tampa. And several of them have been down here to visit, several of the medical directors. And so let's get their attention and let them understand, make them understand what we're trying to do here. TRICARE also needs to understand, and we sometimes get, it's half and half, we get whether we get TRICARE approval or not. And then we set up an out-of-pocket plan. And if you went to, say, uh, uh, Mass General or uh, you go to uh, Brigham, you will find that the cost out-of-pocket is $3,000. And so we've negotiated what I think is a reasonable out-of-pocket charge, which is $279. That's probably the best bargain in medicine. And so. <laughs> It's a, basically a procedure we can do for $199 plus a reading fee. And so how can we do that? How can we afford? Well, the story is that we're doing iterative reconstruction and step and shoot to reduce the radiation exposure of these patients. I don't think it's comfortable to be doing this test unless we can cut down the radiation exposure to that that's the most reasonable ALARA, A-L-A-R-A, that we can get away with nowadays and get decent pictures. And so it costs some money to add this software and hardware to your computer, but we do step, we do step and shoot in the CT on uh, almost all patients, and we do iterative reconstruction on almost all patients. And our goal, and the goal of our tech, is to get the best lowest radiation with the best pictures. So there's basically, we're not doing an LV gram, and we're not getting an ejection fraction, and we're not doing systole. We're only doing diastole. Actually, we're only doing the 75% phase in the RR interval. And so with that, there's no tech time post-processing, where it used to be that a tech would have to spend 45 minutes post-processing this for a radiologist to read. Now, with vital images that we use their software, which is all mechanized for us, uh, and uh, we don't need a tech because we only have the 75% uh, slides, slices. And so with that in mind, there's no post-processing, and so that makes it very cheap. So that's how we're able to do $199 special uh, instead of the $99 special that people do with calcium scoring, which you've seen those advertised for people off the street to come in and get a calcium score, we have an $199 special plus an, a reading fee. So people are glad to pay out of pocket for this. So what about, uh, you know, technically how challenging would it be if, you know, a patient uh, survivor who is getting a CT scan for the you know, evaluation of their cancer and they're, you know, they're getting a standard contrast CT, you know, that they could take a CTA image during that acquisition. Uh, and then uh, I don't think you would have a problem with reimbursement, you know, because if they get a CT for cancer surveillance purposes, then, you know, that's, that's covered. So that's how, cool how difficult is that? Yeah, that's cool that you ask about that. Most of that uh, is low-dose CT without contrast. That's what uh, for the National Heart Lung that uh, they've said if you're a 40-plus pack year, year smoker and you quit within the last 13 years, that you should have a surveillance once a year uh, to look for cancer because that's acceptable and the yield is high. And so that's a low-dose CT without contrast, but you can get a calcium score. And so 
basically we do that. We do the low dose CT without contrast, and uh, we also we gate it then. The radiologist wouldn't be gating it, and so we gate it, and uh, we get two for one. Well, the radiologists don't like that because you know they went, who's going to read it? You know, I'll do the costume school reading. The hospital doesn't like it because how can you bill for two procedures when it's only one? And so actually, uh, we found how we could do that with three procedures. It's the third procedure that you can actually, on females, square the breast for calcium constellations for screening for breast cancer. So now we got three for one. We got calcium squaring of the coronaries. We got breast cancer calcium constellation detection. And then number three is we've got uh, low CT for looking at cancer of the lung. And so the hospitals go crazy over this. When you start missing this, the CFO of the hospital is tearing her hair out because she says, well, what can we do? We can't charge for this. We can't do it. How can you do three for one? And they just, they hate this. You know, but as we change over to uh, some kind of bundled arrangement, uh, ACA, whatever you want to call it, ACO, uh, as we change over with the Affordable Care Act and all of its consequences, we have more opportunity then to do these things because it's not a fee-for-service model where you do one CT and you get paid. Go ahead. Did I did I hear you correctly? You're doing a CTA for two hundred seventy-nine dollars with contrast. That's correct. So you have somebody start start an IV, take a whole IV pack out, inject contrast, which in itself costs about fifty dollars, and you able to charge one hundred seventy-nine dollars for that whole package, including the technician who's going to start an IV, inject it, and everything. Don't you think you're losing money? Okay, look at the uh, calcium score procedure that there are $99 specials all over the United States for bringing a patient in, you know, taking a history. You don't have to start an IV on them. You don't have to uh, well, they open don't an have IV. To have an IV. They don't have to have an IV. But for calcium scoring, it's $99. And uh, and that there's a lot of stuff you're doing there. You, so you're doing a lot of stuff, but you're, as far as your, your disposables, I mean, your disposables for contrast sound like they're going to be right up. I, I can't believe that's a sustainable uh, model, honestly. Because Actually, what it is, it's a, it either is a break-even or a lost leader. And yeah. so, you know, I hope that you've been, to, you've been to Walmart, you know the game, and so you engage the patient, and the, gate, the patient becomes identified to your hospital, and it means a lot because that's the kind of commitment we want. We want loyal patients. And so if you've got $199 boss leader, you're not losing a lot of money. Equipment's sitting there. The tech's there because they have to be there. They're paying an eight-hour day. They may be working seven hours or six hours. They're paying an eight-hour day. You've got all those expenses. The machinery's already been paid for. We paid for that thing a long time ago. And so there's no capital. And so all we have are some disposables. And uh, and we could do that pretty cheaply in some contrast. So yeah, we're doing it. And uh, and and perhaps you can do it if you do it. But maybe maybe it'll cost you three hundred dollars. Maybe it'll cost you four hundred dollars. You know, but that's not unreasonable. I I, I don't know if you've ever done uh, whole body screening with PET scans uh, or uh, with SDP. You think? Aren't we a little off the subject? Uh, we're yeah, talking about the, economics. I mean, I asked the yeah, question. Yeah, the economics of whole, whole body PET scanning is a $3,000 test. I've been able to get that down to $500 out of pocket because the cancer specialists have all bought their, have all bought their own PET scans. So the hospitals are doing seven PET scans a month, you know, for cancer. <laughs> and so when you're doing seven a month, uh, you, you're not doing very well financially, but the equipment's paid for, the tech's paid for, the tech comes to work, equipment sits there. And so I said, well, I'd like to get this for a cheaper price out of pocket if we can't get it paid for. And he said, okay, $1,000. And I said, how about 500 And I said, okay, 500 So it's unheard of to be able to negotiate prices in medicine, but it can be done. And it can be done reasonably. Any comments, Dan? Uh, yeah, I don't usually get to that level of detail. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's 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 move on to the next part of this presentation. And uh, the next part 
So it's kind of interesting because what about inflammatory markers and stenotic markers? And uh, why can't we measure for $75 whether someone out of pocket is the, the most the patient has to pay for some of these tests? Why can't we measure the probability uh, of patients having a stenotic lesion or the probability of patients uh, having inflammatory disease and uh, be able to move from this large intermediate population, intermediate risk from Framingham that Greg was just talking about, and move to either low risk or high risk depending upon inflammatory markers. And so Corus CAD is a test for measurement of predictive value of stenosis. And uh, this is 23 mRNA markers. There was a, a lot of researchers involved in the particular study uh, called the COMPASS study and also uh, the PREDICT study. And the PREDICT study, I think, was at Vanderbilt, Dan. And, uh, the, uh, yeah, Compass actually the, the main publication, John McPherson, was yes, first author. Right. He's, he's, yeah, a, John? he's at Vanderbilt. Yes, indeed. And so the, this test has been validated uh, to take patients and reclassify them according to the metastenosis from the PREDICT study. So the negative predictive value is probably the highest value of doing this test. The next uh, test is an aggregate score of CRP, FDP, HSP, 70, some inflammatory markers, some non-inflammatory markers to uh, predict future risk of death in a mind patient with suspected or known coronary disease. And the validation wasn't very good in this particular test, but it brought up real questions about inflammatory markers and uh, finding uh, a gold standard there. Uh, MI risk of BP is a test that consists of seven protein markers with certain clinical features that are combined and is effective at redefining Framingham intermediate risk multi ethic. It was they used the MESA population, which has a frozen serum, with 43% reassignment of risk from the intermediate into low or high risk. And this is the prediction of having a cardiac event in five years, which is a much more reasonable span of time than 10 years. 10 years seems forever. Five years seems like that's uh, on the horizon. So I was interested in this. I did want to use an inflammatory marker. Uh, it can't be used, it hasn't been ascertained that this is useful for finding a hot plaque. That has that research hasn't been done. It may be on the horizon. And this may be the marker for that. I can't say. But it certainly is a good marker for reclassification. So I'd like to throw this open for discussion. Dan? Yeah, I uh you know, I don't really know about all those things. I think that's this is an area that I uh, am not quite as in tune with in terms of those those particular markers. Okay. Any comments from any of the other audience? Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I came in late, Crone. I'm sorry, I came in late, but I don't understand the relevance of this honestly to cancer patients. Um, your goal is to get them through their chemotherapy and give them the chemotherapy, and not to predict their event, their cardiac events in five, ten years. Um, so, I mean, basically, what would you do if you found these markers suggesting an increased risk of cardiac events in ten years? Would you start treating them all for coronary disease or uh, limit, have some impact on the kind of medication they're getting? Or, I mean, how does this apply to a cancer patient? Well, I think and how does this apply to a, a, an ordinary workup? For a cancer patient, and you've got these oncologists don't, that are that are up to their eyeballs in in protocols and all kinds of things, and you want to add a lot of stuff that is really not going to pertain to the fact this person's got a life expectancy of five years if they're lucky. In many cases, no, I, I agree. With, I agree with that in general, but I would say you know the CT part. I, yeah. I do I do agree with because they're getting a CT for. Uh, you know, screening purposes for their or follow up of their cancer, and if you could add to that uh, coronary CTA, or if you could take some better images, uh, I think that that is really important. And actually, 
you know, you're looking at a window that is five or ten years out, and you know, to to have some other test that they're already getting uh, give you information that says, you know, I need to do a better job of risk risk modification, you know, by increasing or you know, adding a statin or an aspirin in a patient that wouldn't otherwise have a diagnosis of coronary disease, then I think, you know, that is an important test. That yeah, is I think it's a good thing. point because they are already getting the test. And the other thing is a lot of these guys need surgery and they're going to need a pre-surgical cardiac evaluation, or at least they they may not get one, but it wouldn't hurt to have one. And certainly every once in a while we've certainly seen people going through surgery and their troponins are in the teens and 20s, and by God, they got severe two-vessel disease nobody thought they had. Uh, I'm not sure you do anything about it. Sometimes you'll operate on these people before and then go through their surgical, uh, their cancer surgery. So I think that's a, a really good, uh, good point vis-a-vis the guideline. Because uh, you got it. Yeah. I'm not sure you understand that from the beginning how we got to where we are. And so yeah, I'm sorry. Was we, we had a patient that came in uh, who basically was uh, 20 years out from getting radiation therapy for a lymphoma mm. and radiation therapy to the chest. And so we were 20 years out. And so that's how we got, this guy shows up, and we've got to decide what we're going to do with him. And uh, he's had chest pain. He also yeah. had a chest right. pain 20 years ago. And so we're trying to decide what are we going to do with this guy. And so that, that's how we come well, That's another question. Yeah. Yeah, so the question... Uh, led us to, it's a 20 year old event, and so we're trying to decide what we do. And of course, all those patients may frequently, we stumble into main left coronary disease, and uh, sometimes we stumble into uh, severe LED disease. Maybe the rule was the exception, and so that's, that's how we got where we are. Okay. Well, I mean, we had a case about a week ago, actually, the guy is 57 years old who got previous treatment for his uh, non-Hodgkin's, or maybe it was Hodgkin's lymphoma, you know, like 15 or 20 years ago, and once he was found to be in remission, he hadn't seen a doctor in 15 years, and, and you know, he didn't think he had any problems whatsoever. Uh, he presented with chest pain. We did, you know, the usual evaluation, and we find that he has severe, if not critical, AS, he had three vessel coronary disease. His LV function was less than 30, and you know, three out of our four surgeons said we're not doing surgery on him because you know he's too high risk. His his LV function is down. He you know got to replace his valve. Got to do a complex left main uh, LAD surgery, and you know they didn't think he could survive it. And you know so that's a person where clearly. You know, we didn't, there wasn't enough awareness both from a patient but also pr provider point of view that, you know, these patients are going to develop diffuse atherosclerotic disease and add to that, you know, valvular disease from their radiation. And, you know, whatever ways we can sort of improve our detection of that at a better point would be really critical. Did you operate? The fourth yeah, surgeon? got the fourth surgeon and took a four. <laughs> so How'd he do? He did pretty well. They didn't replace the valve. They thought it was not quite so severe. Mm. So they said, let's just tackle the coronary disease, and he did pretty well. So we'll see. We may have That's to a common that. situation. I mean, yeah, I've we may have to tackle Two of those recently, and I got another one the other day at an aortic stenosis, and she'd been radiated for breast cancer 10 years ago. I mean, is that same too soon for breast cancer radiation for aortic stenosis? Mm, it may, I mean, she probably had a condition, you know, I would mm -hmm. guess she may have had a bicuspid valve, and then, you know, the radiation added to that, but mm -hmm. anyway. Yeah. Nice picture. So what happened with, with your patient, Eric? Okay, so we're, we finally got the coronary CTA to show you, and uh, let's get this up here so you can understand it. 
And so uh, maybe Greg can come at, uh, since he's our future multi-imaging fellow, maybe Greg can come in on what he's seeing here. Could I just ask a question before we get into this in detail? And that yeah. is, how useful, it seems to me that with these radiation, um, radiation cardiac stenosis, my impression without any data is that they're going to be heavily calcified. And so in those patients, it would seem like a CTA, where you'd look at the calcification of the valves as well as the coronaries. It would be a kind of a useful uh, screen in those particular patients for coronary calcification. Is, is, that, is there any other comments on that? So here's your guy 20 years later, and uh, yeah. you can That's see good. his calcium. And so the thing that we like about uh, the genetics of this gentleman is that he has the capability of detecting uh, plaque and reacting strongly against it and calcifying it and pushing it out to make the lumen uh, retain its uh, its uh, diameter. And so you mm -hmm. can see where he's done that. These are, he takes internal pimples and converts them to external calcified plaque. And so that's pretty good the way he does it. So he has a good reaction. It'd be nice to be able to measure the genetic propensity for people to be able to react this way and, uh, and repair their arteries in this fashion. Hey, Greg, would you like to say some a few words about what we're seeing here? We must have lost Greg somewhere along the line. So let's, uh, let's just take this and look at it and study it. So I'm making these pictures so that you can readily understand what's happening here. And so I've tried to uh, and shown you the uh, cross sections. And then we've got here some uh, longitudinal picture. And we can actually log row this. And uh, we can color code it. So let's, let's look at some of the bells and whistles we have from our vital workstation, where we'll put the lumen on so that in the cross section you'll be able to see what is contrast and, uh, and what is above contrast. Uh, and so now we're going to put the wall on. Uh, I'm going to label that, and there's the wall now. And uh, may or may not be totally accurate, but let's classify the plaque. And I have the ability here of uh, taking plaques that are less than 50 Hounsfield units if we're interested in that 35 range, I could actually bring this down to 35. And I'm interested in plaques that are fibrous plaques. There is an overlap. But it's usually in the 80 to 100 range. And then I mentioned calcified plaques, which is way up here, 1,300 range. So let's use my uh, plaque identification software. And we're going to turn that on so we can color code this. And with the color coding, uh, you can see uh, if there's some non-calcified plaque, which would be the blue, which is probably the fibrous, and then the red, which is a little red here, and there's a little red there. That represents uh, the liquid plaque. There's some little red down here. And, uh, excuse me. And then the yellow represents the calcified plaque. And then you can see the vessel size. We can measure the diameter. And uh, we also can uh, take this software, and we can give you total plaque volume. As you heard, total plaque volume and calcified plaque volume and non-calcified plaque volume are additive to Framingham and actually establish precedence over calcified plaque. And the only way we can beat coronary calcification is by, uh, by doing this. And uh, so we've done this now, and uh, we're going to add up the amount of plaque here. We're going to do that with the software in a minute. And uh, there we go. Now we've got additive. We've been able to take this artery. We've been able to look at different areas. Look at this area. This is very interesting. Here's the lumen. Here's the calcification. Here's the fibrous. And here's the liquid, the lipid plaque. And so that's right up in here. And that doesn't represent a severe stenosis. You can see uh, how much is involved in the wall there. But there's been some positive remodeling, as you can see, with this plaque poking out on the side. 
So uh, let me move this down here besides the stenosis marker. I'm going to move this down here. And there we go. We've got that moved down there. And then let's look at this so we can see the entire vessel. So I'm going to uh, move over here. And then I'm going to come over here and open this up so I can see more information. So, so these uh, these images come from your 289 special. <laughs> yes, these are from my 289 special. And look how simple it was for me to show this to you. And then we can do it on all three vessels. So let's go look at the right coronary. Yeah, if you figure your hourly your hourly income and you figure out what this cost in terms of your time, it's hard I to get under that. two. For my time and my hourly income, it's probably not financially uh, probably not financially valuable for me to be talking to you right now. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're worth it. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm probably not it's making much money. Not making much money, but it's not about money. It's about quality care. Sure. And uh, and that's what we're doing with imaging. And so let's talk about quality care. You can make this financially viable, and that's a totally different story. And I'll be glad to tell you that story uh, at a later time, because that can be done. So let's look down here. So look, we can see these images. Isn't this beautiful? Yeah, I mean, it really is. Yeah, it's really gorgeous. So what well, did you what did you end up doing with this guy? We got the total flat burden and. We also have, let's go back to, uh, if I can find our slides again, you know, going back to our slide, this might be here somewhere. And here we go, we're back to our slides. Uh, I think that the MI risk VP is also a valuable test, and we're going to prove it because I looked at how it was done. And uh, I studied it. I know about Corus CAD, and we've already looked at the coronary, so we can tell you there's stenosis. So I don't need a test to predict stenosis at this point in our algorithm, but it would be useful for me to have the results of this test in our next meeting. I'll get the results for you. It's a three-day turnaround to get the results. And so I'd like to see that. We're certainly going to engage him in lifestyle changes. Uh, we measure the burden of plaque. We can go back another time. I mean, for three millisieverts of radiation, that's nothing compared with what he's received with his radiation therapy to his chest 20 years ago. So we can we can uh, we can actually do this again another time and see what's happening going forward. We can also look. He has non-calcified and calcified plaques in his neck. I'd like. I really be interested in knowing the correlation of non-calcified plaque in the neck with non-calcified plaque in the heart. So basically, we're going to engage him in lifestyle changes, Mediterranean diet. We're going to show him that uh, he has some vulnerable plaque. We're concerned about that. He does have plaque with positive remodeling, calcium, and non-calcified components, and so he does have some risk of having a future cardiac event. And so he'll be on a statin drug training diet, exercise, and uh, we'll see where else we go with this depending upon his response. And so I'm, so I'm very interested. Now, of course, high-dose statin has been shown to quiet inflammation, and perhaps this inflammatory marker might be useful for monitoring that. And uh, certainly it's been shown with cochicine that plaque does not progress. And so there's another anti-inflammatory uh, drug that can be used uh, if anti-inflammatory markers prove useful. So I'd like to throw this up into further discussion. Yeah, I think the you know colchicine is another another ball ballpark because you know you can't you really probably shouldn't use that for chronic therapy, but temporarily it's it's possibly a good choice. But uh, so you know I think that that's an option, but I don't know if I would feel good about using that on a chronic basis. Yeah, tell me about the downside from chronic use of cochicine. And that's just an aside. I realize we're getting off the path. Yeah, I just think that, 
you know, I've used that in the case of pericarditis and that type of thing temporarily or certainly gout. But, you know, if you use colchicine long term, especially in people that may be at risk for renal insufficiency, then you have some bone marrow suppression and things like that. I see. Okay. Well, we've got, we have some pericarditis patients that are on cochicine for years now because of recurrent pericarditis and um, working with uh, a physician at St. Vincent's who's been very committed to pericarditis studies and research. We, we hit on that's the only choice we had in this gentleman and that's all we can do. We have, we have a couple of those that are long-term cochicine that have done well and adapted. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, there you have a compelling reason. Yeah. Okay, okay any more discussion? Uh, no, that's after nine. No, that probably need to go, but that's a great case, Eric, and thank you for great. preparing that. And those images are really amazing. Are these slides available by any chance? Can we, I forgot. Is there a way to, are they downloaded on a, on a site or someplace so we could just sort of look at them at leisure? Oh, we have uh, we have recorded this conference, and so we can okay. uh, post the recording. Uh, oh, okay. At, uh, we can put the recording into uh, that Dropbox that we have uh, that we have set up, and Dan can get to let you know how to get to the Dropbox. We have a Dropbox. Oh, that'd be up. great. That'd be great. Make that available in the Dropbox. Dan, can you do that? Sure. Yeah, we'll okay. take care of that. Oh, uh, thank you so much. I appreciate right. it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thank you all. Bye. Bye.